Welcome to Neuro Movement Revolution with Anat Benyel, where you will discover breakthrough possibilities for your life through the brain's power to change. We're so happy that you can join us in making the impossible possible. Okay, good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are on our second day of the streaming uh, of the documentary Life Unbound, and I am truly thrilled to have my dear friend, uh, Rick Hansen, uh, be with us today for an interview. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Anad, and greetings to everyone who's participating in this and such an important movie about such an important subject with such wonderful people. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, I'm gonna tell everyone, I'm sure many people already know who you are, you're beloved and famous, and I'm gonna read it for those who uh, could learn a bit more about you. So uh, Rick Hansen, PhD, is a psychologist. He's a senior fellow of UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, and New York Times bestselling author. His books have been published in 29 languages and include the newest one that just came out a few months ago, Neurodharma, Resilient, Hardwiring Happiness, Buddha's Brain, Just One Thing, and Mother Nurture. With 900,000 copies in English alone, his free weekly newsletter has about 200,000 subscribers and his online programs have scholarships available for those with financial need. He's lectured in, at NASA, Google, Oxford, and Harvard, and taught in meditation centers worldwide. He's an expert on positive neuroplasticity. His work has been featured on BBC, CBS, NPR, and other major media. He began meditating in 1974 and is the founder of the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Co Co Contemplative Wisdom. He and his wife live in Northern California and have two adult children. He loves wilderness and taking a break from emails. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> and there's so more wonderful things to say about you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, so let's let's jump in. And I just wanted to tell people that we have extended. We are going to take the full possible time of forty-five minutes for this uh, podcast. So we have a little more of you, Rick. I mean, yeah. I just love hearing yeah. you and your teaching is always incredibly valuable. Mm. So first of all, uh, you are one of the participants in the in the documentary yeah. Life Unbound. And um, uh, why did you say yes to it? Because you don't say yes to too many things. And, uh, and if there's any comment you want to say about the film, and then we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on. Okay. Right. Well, first off, um, we're all busy doing different things, uh, raising a family, running a business, helping other people, just making our way through life. And so we all make choices about what we value. And uh, as soon as I met you, Anat, uh, some years ago, I instantly started really valuing you. And the work that you and um, others such as Neil are doing with you to help really, really uh, people who are very vulnerable and could really use some support. So immediately I wanted to be part of that. And then when I saw how good the background was for the film, of course, there too, I valued it and wanted to be, you know, a part of it too. Um, I would just say for myself, uh, and then I'm sure we'll talk about all kinds of things in my own background, uh, I'm deeply rooted in developmental psychology, uh, the zero to three period, the maturation of the brain, and then lifespan development altogether. And so, uh, you know, I have great interest in children, great interest in families. I know you help people who are not just children, uh, but I just wanted to put that on the table there and say also that I've spent a lot of time in schools, doing therapy with kids, consulting with parents around all kinds of issues, and a lot of psychological assessments. So that part of my background is kind of you know, buried in the basement somewhere, but it's something real that I draw upon. So I'm really happy to be here. My heart goes out to kids uh, and their families. We have a profound duty to them, and I'm really grateful to people like you all who help to fulfill that duty we have to our children and our families. It's so important. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so very much. 
So talking about families, and as I mentioned to you just uh, before we came on, that uh, we since uh, COVID, we cannot do the hands-on work yet in person, mm -hmm. and people can't travel to come to us, you know, there's all kinds of things. Uh, where I looked for a way to still contribute to the development of the children. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it online. We call it the, uh, we started by calling it Through Your Hands, except it's a, a misleading title. So now it's called uh, At Home Coaching mm -hmm. and we're coaching the parents mm -hmm. and, and guiding the parents through, you know, the shift from fixing to connecting and the nine mm -hmm. essentials Brilliant. Uh, to, to utilize those uh, ways within mm -hmm. what they already do. Yeah. Uh, so like they, they feed, they change diapers, they show them how to do math, you know, whatever is going on. And it's, I, I, I we all love it. It's challenging, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it's new and it's very demanding. At the same time, it's fantastic because this this situation led us to, coach the parents and discover how sometimes seemingly minor shifts in the parents' way of interacting with the child mm. completely changes. Things happen. Children start crawling. They start uh, yeah. talking. They start without working on the crawling or on the talking. Yeah. Now, your work is like primo changing how people use their brains and elevating the the quality, literally upgrading the, the brain's functioning into further human development, into intentionality and into harmony and access to the inner self and so on and so forth. And as I also just mentioned before the um, we started that I really, from my very long experience with children and all, almost always have the parents there when I work, how the child's brain and the parent's brain are one brain mm -hmm. and i like the dolphin metaphor the adult dolphin and the baby dolphin that swims for three months oh sweet yeah in the stream and if the if, if he doesn't get the mama dolphin stream or the daddy dolphin stream he will sink and die mm. so it's for real and mm. the adult brain is the stream for the child's brain mm. very much true and if yeah. that adult brain operates at a higher quality doesn't have a lot of God knows what interruptions and upsets. And the, you know. so not to talk more about what we do, I would like you to start talking. And I have a few things uh, that to, to focus on here. Uh, oh, it's over here. So the first thing you, you, um, you, you, you talk about uh, focusing on growing the inner trifecta of calm, contentment and love that you say is high, 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 hardwired into the brain. How about you just talk about that first? And then I want to hear a little bit more about why you say it's hardwired into the brain. Oh, well, that's great. So uh, what you say is of course, absolutely true that, uh, that parents in train, they draw along you know, much in, as the dolphin metaphor in their wake, uh, their children as well as others around them. So one of the most fundamental and very hopeful things a parent can do is in a general sense, raise their own level of being broadly. Well, that's hard to do in the time of COVID. And it's particularly, you know, it's also certainly hard to do if you've got challenging situations such as a child with, with particular needs. So how can a parent raise their level of being? How can they develop resilient well-being in the face of challenges? Speaking of your ocean metaphor, when the waves come, how do we you know, ride them without flipping over and sinking? And how can we recover fairly rapidly? And how can we have confidence that our little boat has a deep keel in the water and skillful sailors so we can go out and take on big opportunities and sail the deep the deep dark blue. How do we actually do that? That's been a profound focus of my entire life, partly because when I started growing up, I was sinking like a stone myself. So I needed to learn how to build and sail a better yeah. boat. You're laughing about it now, but I'm sure it was a lot of suffering. Oh, definitely true. And so um, 
we basically develop ourselves through changing our bodies in lasting ways, particularly our nervous systems and their headquarters, the brain. So the question then becomes, how can we help our own brains change for the better? as well as certainly how can we help the brains of our children change for the better. That's been certainly an enormous preoccupation of yours and the experts uh, you know, that, that have worked with you. Uh, the crux of it, is, as you know, is to turn states into traits. In other words, to help experiences of whatever we want to develop, a child moving in a new kind of way, or an adult experiencing a deeper sense of patience and hopefulness, let's say. How, we need to turn those experiences of whatever we want to grow into some kind of lasting change in the body. Otherwise, it, it might be a pleasant experience in the moment, it might be useful in the moment, but by definition, there's no learning, there's no development, there's no acquisition of inner strengths of any kind. There's no conversion from state to trade. You know, we've left all that money on the table, but there's been no return on investment. So I'm making the same point in a variety of different ways. So how do we do it? How do we turn the experiences we want to develop into some kind of lasting change? So I'd like to apply that to what I think of as the heart of resilience. The true heart of resilience is the combination of inner calm and a sense of strength combined with a sense of gratitude and contentment for the good that remains, the good that is still here and the good that we can also draw upon outside us and inside us, contentment and love. Expressed in a variety of ways, flowing out and flowing in, compassion, kindness, friendliness, forming uh, bonds and, and alliances with others, uh, love. So we have calm, contentment and love. They support each other. And you can just feel it as soon as I start talking about it. Oh, yeah, that's my home. That's our true home. We live in a lot of inner homelessness that can become kind of chronic, oh, inner unfortunately. Inner homelessness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's true. We get driven from our home base by stresses, disturbances, the long shadow cast by our own background, uh, forces outside us that are systemic and discriminatory and prejudiced against us. You know, all of those are factors as well. And so, uh, yes, we sh it's important to do what we can to have the world be better. <laughs> but it's taking a while. <laughs> Meanwhile, what can we grow and develop inside ourselves? That's the essence of self-reliance. So if you want to develop more of the heart of resilience, this, this combination of calm, contentment, and love, we start with simple experiences of these that just happen in everyday life or they, people could listen to someone like you or me or others who can sort of evoke a sense of greater calm or a feeling of gratitude or a sense of compassion and kindness for others or compassion even for oneself. We start with those experiences. And then I want to name three really cool ways we can help ourselves or anybody else to use the power of positive neuroplasticity, the ways that uh, passing patterns of activation in the brain can leave lasting physical alterations in neural structure and function. So I'll mention three things we can do, and then I'll shut up and give no, you a no, chance. I, I, may I ask a question before you go to what you just said? And I don't want to... Okay, okay. Super. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it very briefly, and I'm going like, I, I'd like Rick to slow down a little bit here. And bef before we ask how we do, how we move it from states into trades, Great. how do we get into states intentionally? So I know that you have techniques or oh, okay, methodologies great. to do it. Yeah. Our movement work, which is basically contemplative meditation, kind of self-awareness, yeah. you know, movement that is very transformational and allows for a sense of real well-being. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but can you give people right now, before we say how to groove in the, the yeah. preferred states, how do I get a state to groove? There you go. Very good. Um, well, there are two ways. First, notice moments that you're already having. As you exhale, there's a natural calming and slowing of the heart rate. As you look around you, during the course of your day, there's probably at least one moment where you feel thankful for something. Uh, little things like being able to get fresh water out of a pipe. <laughs> Amazing. A lot of people can't do that. Uh, 
or as you move through your day, notice an experience that's already happening, let's suppose, of, of kindness or friendliness. Like you and I have a lot of camaraderie. We have a long history of friendship and love between us, which is really great and mutual respect. Just it's already happening. I want to emphasize this point. It's already happening. Don't waste it on your brain. Slow down to turn on the inner recorder to help the song that's already playing, the song of an authentic, often mild, but still real sense of calm strength or gratitude and contentment or warm heartedness, help it sink in. So that's, that's just a start, which makes our job a lot easier. You know, it might be a little, the, the other way is to create an experience to create it. So I'm, I'll give you a few suggestions here. And it's great to create experiences, but I want to kind of underline, and unless someone is um, disabled in a way, if, if it's okay to use that word, I'm happy to use a different word if, it's, if another word is, is more appropriate. But unless a person is incapacitated, they don't have a natural, like being severely clinically depressed, let's say, or being delirious out of their gourd, it's relatively easy to have beneficial experiences. Listen to a guided meditation, watch a cat video on YouTube, you know, just uh, kind of have an ordinary life. <clears throat> a lot of research shows that most people are having um, many little moments of well being over the course of the day. So it's relatively easy to have states, to have experiences. The missing piece is we don't learn from them. We waste them routinely. So I want to just, if I could, ring that bell a second time. That said, oh, yeah, you want to have some states? <laughs> so I'll give you some suggestions here. So Okay, before calm. you move, before you yeah. move I, I just want to amplify one thing, and I want yeah. to amplify uh, the gratitude part. Good. And I want to ask you whether you would recommend, because some people, especially if it's in a, you know, in a real because I believe that parents, we work a lot with parents with children with special needs, and and there is a profound trauma for parents to discover, yeah. and it's completely overlooked in the whole process. If you know where everybody's busy with the child and trying to fix the child and trying to keep them alive at times and so on, and the parents are in a, in a sense neglected both by yeah. the outside and they don't have either the time, the idea or the resources to pay attention to themselves. 100%. So, so and, the, and when in such a state, even if somebody remembers to look for gratitude, it might be initially difficult to have the feeling of gratitude. Oh, yeah. Would you recommend for people, like you said, to look for something and I have these windows up <laughs> by, my, mm. by the ceiling yeah the blue skies and just a little bit of the trees every time i look at it the colors they're gorgeous yeah right so even if i don't feel gratitude i can say oh would you recommend for some to say mm. i'm grateful for that or i could be grateful for that like to start somewhere does that lead towards creating the states yeah so let me use this to just you know, connect to those other points. Um, so first off, uh, what we're talking about here is has to be grounded in whatever's authentically true, right? And so, you know, the, the most fundamental practice of all is to simply be with our experiences as they are. Okay. But there's another half of practice, which is to work with our mind. The I waved my arm there. It's like practicing, uh, engaging our, our experiences in any useful way and really coping with life is like a bird with two wings, being with what's there, working with what's there. And a bird needs two wings to fly. So both of these are true. So I wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm talking about working with your mind, but it's in this larger context. Second point is that uh, it's important to appreciate, I think, that the worst our life is, or the more challenges we face, the more the world is mistreating us or not supporting us, or the bigger the job that we have, the more important it is to do what I'm talking about, to grow inner strengths of various kinds, to become more increasingly self-reliant. It, it, what I'm talking about could be understood as some sort of luxury item for yuppies at yoga camp. Like, okay, nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's very far reaching to appreciate that it's enormously hopeful that no matter how bad it is or challenging or difficult it is around you, you can always grow a little every day. 
you can always become a little stronger, a little calmer, a little wiser, a little a little happier, a little more skillful with other people. Really, really important. So on that foundation then, for uh, gratitude, let's say, the second of the three you know, elements that we're talking about here, it's really important, you're exactly right, to go from the idea to the feeling, from the menu to the meal. <laughs> In other words, you know, it, well, and get a few of your brain cells that, that sum up <laughs> ideas in such a wonderful way. Well, it's true. We have these ideas like, like, oh, they're nice to me, but we don't feel anything. Or, oh, you know, uh, I got water out of a, of a faucet, like amazing, right? Compared to a thousand years ago, uh, but we don't even feel anything. So exactly right. So with regard to thankfulness, we start with the idea, and that's okay. And if it's just intellectual at first, I was numb from the neck down when I entered adulthood, and that's where we start, maybe. We just start with the idea. But if you just slow it down a little bit, fairly soon you start to have a feeling, and you're thankful for what you've received from the world. We're grateful for what we receive. So imagine, here's a little way to do it. Um, you know, like I'm looking at the pictures, the 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 flowers, the butterfly look behind you in the yes. shape of a smile. The lips. The, it's actually yeah. lips. Yeah, the lips in the shape of a smile made of uh, butterflies. Um, and I could go, I could look at it and go, thank you. Thank you, someone who made that. Thank you, uh, the human capacity for color vision. Uh, thank you, the reminder of smiles. How do you feel when you say thank you? On the other hand, looking at the same image, no thanks, nah, nah. How do you feel now? Just start by saying thank you, uh, genuinely, right? Or uh, a, you know, a sense of ingratitude is a sense of vulnerability and dependence, which makes people scared sometimes because we have to be humble a little bit or modest a little bit to be truly grateful because it's what we're given. But then that opens us into an appreciation of the vast network of, 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 of supports that exist in our life. But so I, I would just start there. And uh, another key is to try to feel it in your body. Uh, I've worked with a lot of parents. My very first book was about supporting mothers uh, and confronting what is a genuine depleted mother syndrome. And I think more broadly, there's a depleted parent syndrome, especially in a challenging high demand situation. We get depleted, we get run out. We feel like we're running on empty, right? We're out of gas. So it's particularly important to try to slow down, take a breath and see the big picture. Those three suggestions, I come back to again and again. Slow down, take a breath, see the big picture, if only for five seconds. Right there, and as soon as you start to see the big picture and slow down and breathe, you begin to feel your own body. So uh, so that's that one. You know, there are a lot of ways to feel grateful, a lot of ways to feel contented. Uh, there are subtleties of this in which we can become really aware of an internal sense of pressure or stressful drivenness as we get things done over the course of the day. And we, start, and we can start to realize that, whoa, wait a second here. I can still get the same amount of things done, but, but take the pressure off, right? That sense of some kind of force or drivenness on us, which can be internalized from other pe people putting pressure on us. Just, no, back off. I can still move through my checklist. I can still be strong. I can still have endurance, even though when I'm tired, I can keep on going, but I can take the pressure off inside myself and appreciate that there's actually enough already in reality as it is. You know, there's enough air to breathe. My heart is still beating. You know, what is, st what is working is still working, you know. That is not airy fairy. It's not new age pie in the sky, whoopie doo. It's a way to work hard and work long and be effective and dream big dreams, but without stressing and pressing ourselves and operating more on the basis of an underlying thankfulness and contentment and fundamental well being. So that's an option. For calm, I love calm. 
Calm is really important, you know, because I'm sort of mellow by nature, but I have a Ferrari engine inside. I can just hit the gas and and go, as my family knows. So I, including, you know, tip into anger. We can get irritable with other people, exasperated. So you know, how to calm. And I'll give you a couple of quick tips that I think are just really cool. One is take a breath while feeling your chest as a whole. One breath. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. Notice the effect immediately. Just doing that does three good things in your brain. One breath. One, because you're paying attention to sensation, it decreases the voice, it quiets the voice in the back of the head. <laughs> it decreases inner chatter, which is a major driver of stressfulness. Just paying attention to sensations. Second, when you bring awareness to the internal sensations through interoception, you're engaging a part of the brain called the insula on the inside of the temporal lobes, two of them. And when the insula is engaged, it acts like a circuit breaker that quiets the circuitry of the default mode network in the middle toward the back, which is where there's a lot of rumination. It's the basis for a lot of our negative rumination, anxiety about the future, worry about the past, beating ourselves up, holding on to resentments, the default mode network. So tuning into internal sensations, second, circuit breaker, that gets quieter and we feel calmer. Last, whenever we get a sense of things as a whole, you could do it for your chest as a whole or your body as a whole, or just you know the room as a whole, you look out, at the horizon, you get a sense of the bird's eye view. As soon as we do that, activity in the midline of the brain decreases, and that's a part of the brain that's very involved in worrying about the future and obsessing about the past and with a lot of self-preoccupations. And when you get a sense of things as a whole, we engage the right hemisphere of the brain for right-handed people, switch for some left-handed people, but the point is the same. We get a sense of the whole, and um, we come right into the present with less sense of self. Right there, one breath, being aware, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole, has those three neurological pathways uh, for immediate benefit that helps make us calmer. There are other ways too, I'm sure not, you have some of your favorites, other people have their favorites as well, but it's fairly straightforward that we can calm down. Um, one of the things that's really important, uh, maybe I'll finish on this, we'll talk about love next, uh, is I have a lot of experience in wilderness and rock climbing, doing really dangerous things. And sometimes, uh, you know, when things get weird, <laughs> people who slow down survive. Calm and center, find your footing, slow it down, calm down, ground inside. Sometimes we are in a burning building and we have to run for our lives, okay? But most of the time, we can take an extra breath or two to figure out what to do. And the ones who do that, the ones who find their footing, are more likely to make it to the sunrise and bring other people along with them. Absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you said you were going to go to love next. So yeah. I'd like to just keep going. And then uh, I... I after that, just just say at, at least a little bit of, of your amazing new book. Oh, so thank you. Are aware, yeah. And then we'll open it to questions. Fantastic. Questions, okay? Yeah, All I right. love questions. Uh, well, briefly, so, here, so I'll give you this three breaths practice I've been doing. It's really cool. Uh, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, so three breaths. First, and it's an experiment. It's an experiment, and you can practice with it, and you'll, it'll enrich. All right, first breath, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. Second, breathing while feeling caring, maybe with a hand on your heart, bringing to mind someone you like. I'm doing it with a knot. Doing it with you. <laughs> Just simple, focusing on the feeling, breathing while feeling caring. And then the third breath at your own pace could be a little more challenging, breathing while feeling cared about. Mm. What's it like to be with people who appreciate you or wish you well or have compassion for you or like you or love you? Breathing while feeling cared about. And 
And then we'll do it again, start to finish, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. Breathing while feeling caring. And breathing while feeling cared about. Okay. The energy of the whole like, <laughs> completely shifted. It's amazing. It's really remarkable. And just like I said, uh, there's really neat current neuroscience about why these things work, including the breathing while feeling caring, breathing while feeling cared about. Uh, but, you know, just the bottom line, though, is experiential. Yeah. Half a minute, three breaths. You feel different. Did you come with this uh, sequence? Yeah. yeah. I made it up one time and I thought, this is pretty cool. Uh, so tell us about uh, Neurodharma, then your new book. So very briefly, because I know we want to take questions. The cover kind of tells the story. What it's really about is developing seven ways of being by practicing them. The seven ways of being, and I'll just say them. And you can feel them as I say them. And some of them are a little more advanced than others, but we can feel them all. Steadying your mind. Mindful, stable, present. Second, warming your heart. Compassion, kindness, feeling caring. Third, resting in fullness, which is my poetic way of describing emotional balance and equanimity and living life on an even keel. So we have the first three, and we know what they feel like. Steadiness, lovingness, fullness. Great. The next three are wholeness. Feeling whole and complete as you are, and in a sense, experiencing your consciousness as a whole. You're feeling whole. Fifth, receiving nowness. Right at the front edge of now. Right in the present. While, sixth, opening into allness, having a sense of connection with everything. These are my poetic ways of describing it. Feeling really buoyed by life rather than contracted and beleaguered and, and isolated and separated. And last, finding timelessness, a sense of the infinite, the mystery, stillness, ultimate stillness, the absolute, the unconditioned. That's what the book's about. Um, and it's really about practices. It's about developing these qualities over time. I draw upon both modern brain science, uh, the very interesting, cool stuff, and I use the road as a roadmap or a climbing map up the mountain, the Buddha's uh, early teachings that are very pragmatic and psychological and not religious particularly. Uh, so that's what the book's about. It's very accessible. It's completely accessible for beginners, and it certainly describes you know intermediate and advanced stages of practice for people who've been at it for a little bit and are ready for, okay, What's the next thing? So that's what that book's about. And you can get it anywhere. It's in audio. I, I narrated, I read the audio book. So it has all these guided meditations in it. Deep, deep stuff. Awesome. And then I have an online program that goes along with it called the Neurodharma Online Program based on a meditation retreat I taught over 10 days with this material that's well-organized, well-structured. You can find out about it at my website. It's very inexpensive. And we have continuing ed credits for uh, professionals and for anyone in significant financial need. We love giving away. We love scholarshiping people. So that's the book. Yeah. And I'm just going to add that you, you also said to me, that's like the culmination thus far, the culmination and the elevation of all, everything you have already done and learned and know. So mm, thank you. it's, it's a, a, it's a certain step in life, integration mm. and elevation. And I know you'll do much more. So oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, Neil. So can... Anat, yes, if you look in the chat, we're starting to get some questions through. There's also some comments on our Facebook <laughs> live. Uh, would you like me to read the questions? Or yeah, like, how about you read in order that they came? Okay. I can this see them from, myself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you want yeah. me to pick one or two? I see the, yeah, the pick, second pick. and third. Great. Yeah, so, and others, I think, can see the chat too. So, uh, with regard to the first one, who's a, a, a ailing housebound writer, 
so I, you're here, you're talking about what to do when other people trigger us. And here I think there might be a nice useful metaphor from the Buddha who talked about the difference between the first and second dart. The first dart is inescapable physical and emotional pain or discomfort. The brick lands on our foot, the neighbors start yelling, we react to it, okay. Over time, we can try to train ourselves so we're a little less reactive to that. In, in my book, the resting in fullness third practice really focuses on building up inner shock absorbers uh, so that when life lands on us, it, it jiggles us a little less each, you know, as we grow these qualities over time, but still, it happens. What we can have control over, though, are the second, third, fourth, and fifth darts we throw ourselves. We can uh, disengage from our secondary reactions to what has happened. So we can feel the rage. We can feel the anger as a first start, and that's why being with the mind, that one wing of the bird, is in a way the most fundamental wing of all, of the great bird of practicing and self-reliance and coping, being with what's there. We just, we let the wave pass through us. We try not to add fuel to it. We don't fight it. It passes through and we remain peaceful, present, and not destroyed and not tainted or corrupted by what passes through. So that's really the key. And if you find yourself getting caught up in second, third dart reactions, it's, a, it's totally normal. I still do, and I've been at this, as we said, since 1974. But uh, as soon as you notice it, try to disengage from them, and then gradually, as fast as you can, shift. Shift your focus to what's good. I think of life really boiling down to kind of like three things. This is another one of my formulas and not. Deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. Boom. I wish someone had said that to me when I was 15 years old or five years old or 55 years old. Uh, which is, yeah. Anyway, deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. So as soon as we can, as the wave starts to pass and there's some space that clears, Ha! Ah, turn to what's good, which could be compassion for ourselves. That oh, it's 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 annoying, it's aggravating to have our our experience disrupted. Compassion for ourselves, or s turning to um, other things that are indeed going well in our life, or even if it's available to you, compassion for them. It doesn't mean we agree with those. We have compassion for it. We can disagree vehemently. We can oppose them politically. We can think that they deserve certain kinds of consequences, while simultaneously to preserve a freedom in our own heart and to stay at home in our own heart, uh, we can have compassion for them. And I find it's weirdly calming for me to have compassion for those who mistreat me, right? And you might want to explore that as well. So I wish you the best. And by the way, nothing and everything I've said so far is about inner practice. Meanwhile, sometimes we need to do things out in the world, you know, like uh, talk to other people or see if there's some kind of authority who can keep others quieter, um, you know, in certain situations. You know. But it's not either or. But I'm focusing on what we can do inside our own minds because that's my own background and training. Okay. Then I see another one, a toddler with moderate cerebral palsy. This is where I want some help from a knot. I know a lot about the general processes of helping beings to have experiences, but a knot is, of course, a master at helping people have certain kinds of experiences, particularly ones that are somatic, musculoskeletal, that, that engage the, the nervous system in very competent ways. And also, I'm very knowledgeable in general about things that people can do inside their own minds to maximize the impact, the beneficial impact of the experiences they're having. But that's harder to do uh, with children because they're less able to self to, 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 to do things inside their own minds. That's why they need external support. I'll maybe name just three keys and then take give it to you and not about this particular question. One key is to extend the duration of the beneficial experience. And I, this is, I'm sure, what other people who are effective do. Keep the neurons firing together longer 
so they tend to wire more together as well. A second suggestion is multimodality. In other words, this is where I think or not you're just a complete genius you know, among other areas where you bring in other parts of the body or other systems, you bring in emotion, you bring in cross-lateral movement, you bring in social experiences. The richer the experience is, the more of a neurological trace it's going to tend to leave, episode by episode by episode. And then last suggestion, also a knot in your work, focusing on what's rewarding, heightening the sense of enjoyment, pleasure, meaningfulness, self-worth, being appreciated by others, rah, rah, zis, boom, ba, you can do it, all that kind of stuff increases activity of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain, which heightens the conversion from the, of the experience that we're having at the time into lasting change in the brain as it gets consolidated into long-term storage. So there are ways in which we can help people we're working with, for example, to really enjoy the process. So in addition to being more motivated to keep on doing it, it increases learning from the experiences they're having at the time. Awesome. So I'm gonna say it very quick, and a lot of it is what you've said, and I'll say it in my words, some of the same words. The very first thing is slow, slowing down. Now, if a child is, has a tantrum and like that, you don't go to this slow because they're not going to even notice. But you match them and you just, so it's kind of like the wing of that you talk, the being with, you are being with where the child is. And then from there, starting to slow down. And it's amazing. It's again, it's the current. I mean, I, it all I, it has never I think has never failed with autism with anything I mean okay yeah. number that's one. great right on second right. one is you you didn't say that much but what is in what you said today is enormous amount of developing one's own awareness the ability to know that I know the ability to yeah. see that I'm waving my hand to become aware right yeah we find with this remote the coaching of parents, we, we coach them how to narrate what's happening at the moment with the child yeah. and what the child perceives. So, oh, you're banging your leg. Oh my God, this makes a lot of sound. Does this hurt? You pepper it with little questions. So putting questions in and then narrating, mommy's talking to you. Is mommy banging? No, should she bang the leg? Oh, let me bang it two times. It, I, I mean, kids get hit. I do it, I, I do it through Zoom with children I've never met before. And in a nanosecond, they're transfixed. And what I found amazing, I do it sometimes in English with non-English speaking kids, and it still works. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Narration, storytelling, awareness, very powerful. Yeah. What you said, success, you know, it's not so, so much rura rara, but it's within what's going on. If you ask for what the child is going to be doing anyway, yeah, it's going to be success. So you're building success, not by trying to get the child what you think they should do, mm. but by going to what they are doing. And then what you do so much, I mean, your book has so much of it, is variation. Mm. The brain is a variation cookie monster. Mm -hmm. It can't have enough variations yeah. within a context, within yeah. a theme. And the variations at times that people can work, I've had people work like martial artists, you know, high level and so on, literally for 10 years trying to master something. And I work with them just failing, doing variations around it. 15 mm. minutes, they get it. Yeah. I mean, it's very potent. And the last thing that the word that you said that I think is so, so, so powerful is process. You know, when I tried a few weeks ago, actually, to explain something to a family and they have goals for the child, right? They should sit at this time and say, and out of my mouth popped, my, my goal is the process. Mm. I don't have a goal of outcome. My yeah. goal is bringing to life the river, bringing to yeah. life a process. Mm. So I don't know a child that won't come down around that and learn and surprise the parents with how brilliant they are. So that's my way of answering that question. Mm. That's great. 
I know we have to finish, and I, I just wanted to say one brief, brief thing, including related to Vicky's comment in the chat, which is, uh, there's a phrase in my tradition, 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. In other words, life is complicated. Uh, Alan Watts put it, life is wiggly. <laughs> there's a lot to it. And I think about just the two words, and also, and also, and also. And the one doesn't take away from the other. Right, uh, the tragedy, injustice, the difficulty, the stress, the loss of dreams, hopes destroyed, you know, that's true. And also, and also water comes out of a faucet and also there is love in our heart still that radiates in all directions, no matter who or what moves through it. And also there are people like Anat who are trying to help and also the sun is shining and also People are pushing brooms at three o'clock in the morning in hospitals trying to help other people and also what is true. And so what's useful is to appreciate the whole of it. It's not either or. To bow in this direction and also what is true that we can take refuge in, we can gather strength from, and we can be fueled by to help ourselves and then through us help other people. Great. Amazing. And I just the comments, thank you. What a gift you gave us today and our community. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, happy heart to you all. Many appreciations. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Neuro Movement Revolution with Ana Benyel. You will find all of our podcasts and additional resources on our website at www.anatbenielmethod.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast for free on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. We look forward to seeing you online for our next Neuro Movement Revolution.